Technology 440 General Microbiology Lab. And this is a, um, a PowerPoint to introduce our microscopes and microscopy. So unit five or um, lab manual chapter five. Many of you have already had anatomy and physiology, so I know you're, you feel pretty comfortable with a microscope. In microbiology, because we work our way up to the oil immersion lens, there's a few more rules we have to learn. Um, so first we'll give a little bit of history and then we'll talk about parts, names and parts of the microscope, and then how to use the microscope. So we want to recall from the history section that um, Anton von Leeuwenhoek is often called the um, father of microbiology. And the reason for this is, is that he wasn't the first one probably to um, observe uh, microbes, but he was the first to um, report the existence of microorganisms to the Royal Society of London, and thus he is um, known as the father of microbiology. Just some quotes, I've spent more time than many will believe making microscopic observations, but I've done them with joy and have taken no notice those who have said, why take so much trouble and what good is it? So Leeuwenhoek wasn't the first to develop microscopes. Um, it's thought that um, Galileo actually um, probably made a microscope maybe one of the first microscopes. He's more famous for making telescopes, but obviously he was really good with lenses. Here in the middle diagram, this is Robert Hooke, um, uh, an English um, scientist who made a compound microscope. Compound microscopes have two or more lenses, but the quality of its lenses wasn't as good as the lens of the simple microscope that um, Leeuwenhoek made. So Leeuwenhoek's simple microscope, just a single lens, was actually more powerful, had greater um, resolution than Robert Hooke's microscopes. And it's believed that with the, um, the um, Leeuwenhoek microscopes, they had a um, magnifying power of 200 diameters, which is very, very good. So again, um, this was in the 1600s. Um, Leeuwenhoek was a Dutch linen merchant, so it was thought that he used magnifying glasses to examine the cloth, the linen that he was purchasing. Um, he was very secretive of how he made his microscopes, how he made his lenses, so he didn't share the, the skill, the art with other people. Um, but he was really curious. He loved to look at everything in his environment from pond water to blood um, to insect parts. Um, he takes scrapings from his mouth and, um, and examine all, all of these, looking for his wee beasties, he called them, or animal cules. So th those are early names for microorganisms. Wee, wee beasties or animal cules. Um, here on the, the um, left-hand side, these are actual drawings that Leeuwenhoek made. Um, of the microbes that he observed. And again, it's just phenomenal that he made these observations so early on. And then what folks have tried to do is looking at his drawings, try to find um, um, the identity of the, of the microbes. So I believe here in this figure A, they thought this could be a Campylobacter bacterium. Figure B, this little dotted path shows that this is a motile bacterium, a bacterium that can move. Usually they move with the aid of flagella. And then here, let's see here, figure E, it was believed these might be some oral diplococci, so this, these could belong perhaps to the genus Streptococcus. And let's see what else do they have here. Um, this, um, this little spiral shape bacterium, G, was thought to be either um, a spirellum or an oral from the mouth, a spirochete such as Treponema denticola. And then this last little guy down here, they're calling it the fusiform bacterium. They're thinking this could have been Leptotrichia or Leptotrix bucalis here. So again, Leeuwenhoek's the, the power of his microscope and his incredible observation observational skills really did make him the first to report the existence of microorganisms. So the microscopes we're going to be look, using are called light microscopes, and they're called binocular, um, by referring to the fact that we, there are two ocular end lenses. The ocular lenses, ocular referring to eye, are the lenses closest to our, uh, to our eyes. And then furthermore, another set of lenses are called the objective lenses, and um, the objective lenses can be moved into place 
by moving this rotating nose piece here. And it will be really important that we know the magnification of the individual lenses and then total magnification. And we're going to learn that total magnification is the product, meaning we're going to multiply the magnifying power of the ocular times the magnifying power of the objective lens. So with our light microscopes, total magnification, depending on the objective lens we're going to use, um, from the lowest total magnification is 40x, 40 diameters, all the way up to 1,000 fold or 1,000 diameters. And this is using our oil immersion lens. So the resolving power, the resolution of our microscopes, we can distinguish as separate objects as small as 200 nanometers. That's uh, 0.2 micrometers, so that's going to be the, the resolving limit of our microscope. Um, items smaller, we won't be able to see. We're going to use visible light, and we can use our light microscope to examine um, cells of any cellular organisms, animals, plants, fungi, protists, bacteria, and archaea. However, most viruses are going to be too small for us to see with our light microscope. Um, one exception is the pox virus family. They're large enough so that we might just be able to see them using our light microscopes. But in our course, we're going to say in general, to visualize viruses, we would have to use more powerful electron microscopes. So as you might guess, it's going to be really important that you know the, the parts of the microscope, their functions, how to use the microscope, and very importantly, how to take good care of it. So I think we have a number of different labeled microscopes. So let me see if I can just go over this really quickly here. So here are the two oculars right here. The diopter adjustment ring is really, really um, important in preventing headaches and dizziness. So what the diopter adjustment ring permits, it lets you focus your um, the left ocular independently from the right ocular. So if any of you are feeling seasick or dizzy or getting headaches, um, ask me if I can help you adjust your left ocular so it's the left ocular is and um, permits perfect focus with the left eye and um, and is compared to the right eye. So this is the head of the microscope and please folks don't loosen the screw and twist the head around. Um, we've had heads fall off and then we have the, the possibility of damaging the microscope so please don't rotate the head. Um, here's the uh, rotating nose piece, sometimes referred to as the turret. And again, by rotating the nose piece, we can move the four different objective lenses into place. Here we have the frame. And this, this is wonderful, um, this mechanical stage here. Um, this is the stage. Think of a stage like in a theater. This is where the action is going to happen. So we're going to put our microscope slides here. There are some slide clips that will open and then gently release to hold the slide in place with our mechanical stage. And the beauty of the mechanical stage is that we can use these mechanical stage adjustment knobs to move the slide uh, right to left, forwards and backwards, pre precisely over the stage. So this helps us so much in being able to look at multiple fields of view. The stage is moved up and down using these um, focus adjustment knobs. And there's two knobs, two focus adjustment knobs, and it's really important you know which is which. So this outer, this outer focus knob is, course, is called the coarse focus adjustment. And you'll see when you rotate it, the stage is going to move up and down in large increments. So we only use coarse focus adjustment with the shortest objective lenses. So that would be the 4x scanning lens and then the 10x low power lens. We never ever use a coarse focus adjustment knob with our longest lenses, um, our high dry power lens, the 40x lens, and our 100x or oil immersion lens. For those long lenses, the oil immersion lens and high dry lens, we only use fine focus adjustment. And we'll see, we'll go over the process for focusing, is we're um, always going to start looking at our specimen using the shortest lens, the scanning lens, We'll get our specimen to focus using coarse focus, and then because our scopes are what we call parfocal, we should then be able to move to the next highest lens, the low power lens, and because the scopes are parfocal, the specimen should still be in focus. Um, it should only require minor adjustment using fine focus. So we always start getting the specimen in focus with scanning 4x, move up to low power, then we move up to um, our high dry lens, and in event eventually, 
um, in the smears and stains labs will be moving up to the oil immersion lens. And again, with high dry and oil immersion, you only use a fine focus adjustment knob, which just barely moves the height of the stage. Um, there's a hole in the stage that will permit light to hit the specimen. And if we look beneath the stage, you'll see it's, a, it's like a combination of two functional parts. One is, one is the condenser, the substage condenser, and this is a series of lenses that focus a light on your specimen, and that's going to help increase resolution. And then along with the substage condenser, there'll be a little lever. That's the iris diaphragm lever. Iris diaphragm acts almost like a mechanical pupil. Um, by moving the lever, you can open or close um, the... Um, the, the iris diaphragm. When you open it, it lets more light through, which will increase resolution. When you close the iris diaphragm, it decreases the amount of light that strikes your specimen, and that will increase contrast. So there's always these opposing forces. If we increase resolution, we're usually decreasing contrast. Um, with most of our bacteria, we usually stain them to increase contrast, and because the bacteria are so small, our stained bacteria, when we're looking at them with our microscope, we're always trying to increase resolution. With um, living specimens, um, for example with wet mounts, very often we're trying to increase contrast, and we'll be talking about the adjustments we'll make for that. If we go down here to the base, we'll see that um, the light bulb, the light source is in the base. There'll be a light on and off switch. Um, the rheostat is how we're going to control the, um, the intensity of light, the brightness, and again, to increase resolution, we want lots of light. To increase contrast, we're going to be cutting, cutting back on our light source. I think that's it. Just another diagram here. Okay, so a concept that we'll need to know for our microscope quiz and the lab practical is we need to know how to calculate total magnification. And the formula for total magnification, you take the magnifying power of the ocular lens and you multiply by the power of the objective lens that you're, that you're dealing with. So here are the names of the four objective lenses. So you want to know their names and their magnifying powers. Okay. Um, most microscopes, the ocular lens magnifies um, tenfold, ten diameters. So if we're using the scanning lens, if I asked you for total magnification, you'd go, okay, 4x of the objective lens itself times the ocular lens. So that means total magnification for scanning is 40x. If we did the same process for the low power lens, um, 10x times 10x is 100x. The high dry lens, um, the objective lens magnifies 40-fold, so 40, 40 40 times um, tenfold magnification is 400, and the most powerful um, objective lens, the oil immersion lens, magnifies um, 100 fold, so 100 times 10 is 1,000. So the, um, the, the greatest magnification that we can achieve with our light microscopes then is going to be 1,000 fold magnification. Now, what's this DFOV? This, this is sometimes a little stressful for folks. So DFOV stands for the diameter of the field of view. So when we look through the microscope, the circle we see, that circle is what we call the field of view. It's, it's the, the, the surface area of the specimen that we're actually seeing. And because it's a circle, we know there's a diameter to it. And the diameter is the distance from one side of the circle to the opposite side through the midpoint. So by knowing the diameter of the field of view, the DFOV, this almost acts like a little internal ruler for us, and it permits us to estimate the size of cells that we're, exer we're observing with our microscope. So consequently, knowing the size of cells, that's a big step in knowing the classification of the cell. So um, we want to notice here, here we've have the diameter of the field of view in mill millimeters with each of the objective lenses. Notice as the magnifying power goes up, the diameter of the field of view goes down. Okay, so these are values um, on a microscope quiz or lab exam. We would give you the diameter of the field of view for a particular objective lens in millimeters, but you must know how to convert the diameter of the field of view from millimeters to micrometers. Micrometers is the unit we use to express the size of our microorganism, our bacteria, for example, or, or um, fungi or yeasts. So as an example, 
Since the diameter of the field of view with the scanning lens is 4.5 millimeters, and we know there's a thousand micrometers in every millimeter, um, that means that the diameter of the field of view using the scanning lens is going to be 4.5 times 10 to the 3 micrometers, or 4.5 ti um, times 1,000 micrometers. So again, make sure you can, can convert from millimeters to micrometers. Just memorize um, 1 millimeter equals 1,000 micrometers. And this is just a little, a little cartoon to show you how we can use the diameter of the field of view to estimate the size of cells. So we're going to pretend we're looking through our microscope. This is the diameter of the field of view. And these little balls represent maybe microbial cells. Okay. So um, if we know we're, look, we're using our oil immersion lens, then we know the diameter of the field of view is 180 micrometers from the previous table. So what we want to do is estimate what's the diameter of an individual cell. Now this is the part where some folks are aren't sure of themselves. What you have to do is you have to visualize, you have to visualize how many cells would it take lined up side by side to span, to cross the diameter of the field of view, right? So we could estimate in visualizing, maybe it take about 10 of these cells side by side to span the diameter of the field of view. So we take the number of cells, 10, we know the diameter of the field of view, so the formula we use is diameter of field of view divided by the number of cells required to span the diameter of the field of view. That will give us the size of an individual cell. So here, if we work this out, we know the diameter of the field of view with oil immersion is 180 micrometers divided by 10 cells to span the diameter. So our answer would thus be that the diameter of one cell is 18 micrometers per cell, or if we expressed it in nanometers, that would be 18,000 nanometers. And sometimes we'll ask that on exams to convert from millimeters to micrometers, from micrometers to nanometers. Um, this is a really nice video from CSU Fresno, an introduction to the microscope use, so please take a look at that. And I, these were some really good YouTubes um, by Oliver Kim, and I'm afraid from, from a couple of reports these links might not um, be active anymore, so I apologize for that, and I'll try, to, I'll try to find some new links for us. And again, I'm, it, I'm, this would be so sad if Oliver Kim's YouTubes have been taken down, because they were really good, so let me know if these links are not working. I'll try to find substitutes. Okay, so again, from folks that have had ANP, I know you feel really confident in how to use your microscope and how to focus, but in micro, since we so often are using our oil immersion lens, I hope you will be patient with me. Um, we want to make sure that we're all using the scopes in the same way, and this is really to help prevent damage to the oil immersion lens. Okay, so just really briefly walking through this, um, when you're getting ready to look at your specimen, you want to lower the stage using coarse focus adjustment, open up the slide clips, slide your, um, your slide onto the stage, um, and secure it with the slide, um, the slide clip. Don't release a slide clip lever um, quickly because it could break your slide. And then looking from the side, um, you want to make sure that you move your scanning X, the, the shortest lens, into place. And using your course focus, you're going to raise the slide all the way up while looking, um, um, at, looking from the side to make sure that the stage doesn't ram into your objective lens. It shouldn't. And so th only then are you going to look through your ocular lenses and you're going to focus your specimen by lowering the stage using your course focus adjustment. Now the reason we want to do this is that if we focus by lowering the stage, will never run the danger of, rab of ramming the slide and the stage into the objective lens. If we're going to focus by lowering the stage, right, we shouldn't ever ram the stage and slide into the objective lens. Once you have the specimen in focus with scanning, you're going to look, uh, look from the side, gently rotate the low power, the 10x objective lens into place, make sure it clicks into place, um, and then you're going to look through the oculars, and again, since the scopes are parfocal, it should only take minor adjustment 
um, with the fine focus adjustment knobs to get the specimen into focus again. And then once in focus, on the um, low power of the 10x lens, look from the side, rotate the high dry lens into place. Now be careful because see how long that high dry lens is? Um, it's so long it would be really easy to ram the, the slide and the stage into that really long high dry lens. So we rotate the high dry lens into place, we look through the oculars, and we only use the fine focus adjustment knobs then just for a little adjustment to get our specimen in focus with the high dry lens. Um, we, um, in this first um, microscope exercise, we aren't going to use the oil immersion lens. We will start using the oil immersion lens when we do our smears and stains uh, lab, chapter 8. However, um, we do want to talk about how, you, how, how to use the oil immersion lens. And in addition, on bench four, we'll have some demo scope set up of urethral exudates from patients suffering with um, Neisseria gonorrhea. And those, will, those specimens will be in focus using the oil immersion lens. So we, we want you to know how to, how to use these properly. So um, if you were going to use the oil immersion lens, you'd first work your way up. Um, getting your specimen in focus all the way up to the high dry lens and then looking from the side you'd rotate the high dry lens out of place you would place a drop of immersion oil a very high quality oil right on top of the specimen on your slide and then slowly and gently you rotate the oil immersion lens into place now the tip of the oil immersion lens should make contact with the oil um, we want that oil to fill the airspace so there's a bridge of oil from the surface of your glass slide to the oil immersion lens. That's why it's called oil um, immersion, immersion, immersion oil to be to be touching, to be immersed in. And again, th it's only then that you would look through your oculars, and with only one or maybe two turns of your fine focus adjustment knob, your specimen should come into focus. Never, never turn the fine focus adjustment knob more than two or three turns. Um, some people just spin the fine focus adjustment knob, and that's going to strip the gears and ruin the scope. So if you can't get your specimen in focus with only one or two turns of the oil excuse me, with the fine focus adjustment knob, <clears throat> please call me over because there might be something wrong with your scope. Very importantly then, when we're finished looking at our specimen, we want to rotate back to the scanning lens, the shortest lens. <clears throat> excuse me, using coarse focus, we're going to lower the stage. We'll open the stage clips, remove our slide. If we're not going to save the slide, the slide goes into the sharps container in the kill area. And then very, very importantly, we want to clean the lenses. And the only paper we use in our lab to clean our high-quality um, lenses is lens paper. It's the only paper that won't scratch the optical coating on our um, ocular and objective lenses. So um, be generous. If you need to use multiple pieces of lens paper um, to get all the oil off the oil immersion lens, yeah, be generous. Um, also check to make sure that by accident you didn't get oil on the high dry, the 40x lens, which often happens. And if it's the end of the lab, make sure that you also use additional lens paper to clean the ocular lenses and the um, scanning and low power lenses as well. So these are these are really nice quiz or lab exam questions. So um, if we're working with stained specimens and we have really little cells, for example, bacteria cells, um, and if they're stained, what we want to do is increase resolution. So we're going to increase resolution by increasing the amount of light that strikes our specimen and then enters our eye. Um, that light, then um, that those photons of light, they strike our retina. They generate action potentials, which travel back to the visual centers of our brain and supply, supply data points. So the visual center of our brain can create this nice, clear image of our cells. So to increase resolution, then, we want to increase the amount of light striking the specimen. So we can do that by increasing the um, light, light intensity using the rheostat. We can raise the substage condenser, and we can open the iris diaphragm. Now, in contrast, if we're looking at larger cells that aren't stained, for example, if we're doing, say, wet mounts of maybe Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, bakers or brewers yeast, what we want to do is we want to decrease the amount of light striking the cells. If we have too much light, 
will have um, too many photons striking the retina and it will just be this, this glare. We won't be able to see the individual cells. So to increase contrast, we want to decrease light by reducing the rheostat. We can lower the substage condenser and we can close the iris diaphragm. So those would be adjustments to increase contrast. Notice that the changes we make to increase resolution are the opposite adjustments when we want to increase contrast. So some of the specimens we're going to cover, um, um, one of them we're going to be making a wet mount of the aquatic, aquatic means water, of the aquatic plant Elodea. This is a real common aquarium plant. So what we want to do is make a wet mount. We want a nice clean microscope slide. We want to take one of the younger leaves from the growing tip of the Elodea. Just take one leaf, um, place a drop of the aquarium water on your slide first, and then pull off an Elodea leaf and, and um, lie it flat on um, within the drop of pond water. You don't want it folded because it'll be hard to see individual cells, and you don't want um, two or more leaves because, again, it'll be really hard to see individual cells. We're next going to cover the leaf with a glass cover slip. Be careful, those cover slips can cut your hands. We're going to start out looking at the Elodea leaf with scanning, then we're going to move up to low power, and we'll end with our high dry, our 40 objective, and you want to make observations, draw what you see as we go. And so some of the questions here, um, can you see chloroplasts? And what are chloroplasts? Why are chloroplasts green? What's the function of the chloroplasts? Very important, you guys, what is the origin of the chloroplasts? And why are they moving? There's a really cool video that a former student, Rose, um, sent us, and I think I have it on this PowerPoint, so you can see the chloroplasts are moving around the perimeter of the cell. You want to identify the cell wall and make an estimate of approximately the length and diameter of one cell using the diameter of the field of view. So this is a macroscopic view of the Elodea. It belongs to Kingdom Plantae. Okay, so this is what you'll be, this is the specimen we'll be using in lab. Here is a light micrograph showing individual cells. They look like little shoe boxes because they're plants. They have a cell wall and they have a central vacuole filled with fluid that pushes the cytoplasm up against the, um, the cytoplasmic membrane and cell wall here. And here we see these beautiful little chloroplasts. They're just gorgeous. And this is the video of the cytoplasmic streaming, which is moving the chloroplasts around the inside of the plant cell. And um, the cytoplasmic streaming will be most impressive in the youngest cells. So that's why we want to go for the youngest leaves. Um, in addition, we'll, we'll be looking at prepared slides of no stock. So these will be on a slide tray at the front of the lab. So you want to um, retrieve a no stock slide. We're going to go through the same procedure. We'll examine using scanning, um, low power, and then high dry. You want to estimate the size of a single cell. And then again, we're going to ask some questions. So in nature, these cells would appear green. And now why do you think they're going to appear green? And what's the, what's the name of the photosynthetic pigment that appears green? And what is its function? Um, question number five here, folks. This is a tricky one. So no stock are cyanobacteria. That means they are bacteria. They belong to domain bacteria, and they're, they are um, prokaryotes. So this would be a great quiz or exam question. So do no stock and other cyanobacteria, since they have chlorophyll A, do they have chloroplasts? Okay. So we'll let you think about that. <laughs> and then um, we're going to talk a lot about um, Lynn Margulis' endosymbiotic theory, which explains the origin of eukaryotic chloroplasts and mitochondria. So we might say, well, what do no stock and cyanobacteria in general have to do with the endosymbiotic theory? So this is just a little description of the no-stock. Um, I'll just run through it really quick. So this is a photomicrograph of no-stock with heterocytes. Um, these bigger cells are called heterocytes. This is where the no-stock creates an anaerobic environment. So this incredible enzyme called nitrogenase can carry out the function of nitrogen fixation. And nitrogen fixation is when the cells take atmospheric molecular nitrogen and convert it to ammonia and eventually ammonium. 
Now, the reason this is really important is most organisms, like ourselves, we can't use molecular nitrogen as a source of nitrogen to make proteins, to make nucleic acids, but we can use ammonia or ammonium to make amino acids, proteins, and nucleic acids. So we, we are really grateful um, for organisms like the cyanobacteria that carry out this cool process called nitrogen fixation. They take all of this um, atmospheric nitrogen and convert it into a form that we all can use um, to make proteins and nucleic acids. The smaller cells here, these are the photosynthetic cells. Um, during oxygenic photosynthesis, the cells are producing molecular oxygen, O2, um, and uh, molecular oxygen will inactivate nitrogenase. So this is why cyanobacteria, they have two separate two different types of cells. The smaller cells are for oxygenic photosynthesis. The larger cells called heterocytes, the older term was heterocysts. These larger cells, these heterocytes, um, their job is to protect the nitrogenase and so that nitrogen fixation can occur. The third specimen we'll be looking at will be demoscopes on bench four. These are prepared slides um, described as urethral exudates from humans suffering with um, Neisseria gonorrhea, a sexually transmitted bacterial pathogen. And in men, if the genital tract is infected with Neisseria gonorrhea, it causes a really strong inflammatory response. So we have recruitment of lots and lots of white blood cells, lots of what are called PMNs, polymorphonuclear leukocytes, or neutrophils. And as a result, we get the, these white blood cells contribute to this pussy exudate here. And this is kind of classic um, for Neisseria gonorrhea infections. So what we can do if we had a patient and we were concerned that they had perhaps had gonorrhea, we can take a little sample of this urethral exudate, this pus, and smear it on a glass microscope slide, stain it, and then look at it under the microscope. And these slides are just amazing, folks. It's like a Shakespearean drama occurring there. And what we're going to see, let's take a look at this... Um, the a stain smear. Oh, but first let's do this really quickly, just going over the Neisseria gonorrhea. So from time in it, from time of first being infected to um, clinical signs, it could be two to, to eight days. Um, in in men, we get this acute urethritis with this urethral discharge, and what's this gonorrhea, folks? It can be treated with antibiotics. This is why you know good regular health checkup is so important, because if this infection is isn't treated, if the person doesn't get antibiotic therapy, it can cause an ascending infection, epididymitis, prostitis. With chronic infections, you can get um, um, stricture of the urethra and periurethral abscesses with multiple discharging sinuses. So this is, and I, and I can't imagine how painful this would be on top of it. So again, this is a bacterial infection, um, Neisseria gonorrhea. It is acquiring antibiotic resistance, but we, there are still antibiotics with which we can successfully treat these gonorrhea infections. And we just need to make sure everybody has access to good health care so they can get treatment. Okay, so let's go to um, um, this beautiful light micrograph. This is... Um, after gram staining, the urethral exudate on the um, um, on on our slides, and now we're looking at the stain smear using our oil immersion lens. So these large cells here, these big red things, these are the nuclei of the white blood cell of the patient, and a lot of these a lot of these white blood cells are leukocytes that have these multiple lobes. These are um, sometimes referred to as PMN, polymorphonuclear leukocytes, and um, there's three types of them, but the predominant one in this smear is the neutrophil. They're, they're the EMTs. They're the first responders. Um, possibly within minutes or hours, they arrive at the scene of microbial invasion, and their job is to try to quickly ingest, eat the invading uh, microbes. So let me see if I can get my... Oops, sorry. See if I can get my pointer going here again. Nope, I can't get my pointer going. Oh, here we go. Okay. So, for example, right here, this is this is a hard-working neutrophil right here. We see the multi-lobed red nucleus here, proving that humans are indeed eukaryotes. And I know here it's kind of hard to see, but th there's these little tiny dot, dot, dots, dot, 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 dots. 
And those little dots, they're little ball-shaped cells called cocci. Often they're in pairs, so we call them diplococci. These are the cells of the Neisseria gonorrhea. And what's so incredible here is this neutrophil has ingested so many of the Neisseria gonorrhea. So the neutrophil is going to try to kill those Neisseria gonorrhea, right? And so we can see that Neisseria gonorrhea, we can find some that are outside the neutrophil, so they're still free, causing havoc. But then we see these incredible... Um, white blood cells that have successfully ingested a lot of the Neisseria gonorrhea. So great, like I said, great drama going on here with these slides. So um, questions we can ask is for you to um, identify the large cells, like these human uh, leukocytes, and ask you to classify them. Are they um, acellular or cellular? Are they prokaryotic or eukaryotic? Uh, to which domain? To which kingdom? do these large cells belong? And then we could go through the same exercise in identifying the Neisseria gonorrhea, the bacterial cells here. Okay. Microscopes here are so important, you guys. The way the budget's going, your great-grandchildren might be using these same microscopes. So just really quickly, always carry your microscope using both hands. You want to have one hand under the base, one hand holding the, the arm of the microscope, and you want to hold it close to your body with your elbows tucked in, not, not pointing outwards, because it's quite crowded in our microscope lab. Um, never drag the scope over a surface. They have little rubber pads on the bottom of the base, and the, um, if you drag the scope, the friction will cause a microscope to bounce and that will destroy the lens and mirror system. To prevent bouncing, a trick we learned from the A&P folks is just put a piece of paper on your bench and then place your scope on that piece of paper. The paper reduces the friction so you can slide your scope over the um, surface of your bench. Please don't rotate the head of the microscope. You want to um, first wrap excess cord around the electrical outlets when you plug in your scope. Don't let the cord drape down over the, the edge of the bench because that's like a, a, a lasso trap. It's going to trip you. You're going to get hurt. The microscope will get pulled onto the, the um, floor and be damaged. Remember, we only use lens paper to clean the ocular and objective lenses. When you're finished with the scope, this is really important. You want to lower the stage, turn the rheostat down. Um, and turn the microscope off. You want to center the mechanical stage, return, return the scanning lens to position, securely wrap the cord around the base, and use lens paper to clean all the lenses. You want to return your scope to the proper location, the proper cabinet, make sure the arm and the number is facing outwards. If when you go to Excuse me, if when you go to retrieve your scope you see that it's been replaced incorrectly, um, you're going to write up a little ticket for um, the student that used that scope before you, and that will be communicated with their lab instructor, and, and steps will be taken to make sure that the scope is taken care of properly. Otherwise, points will be deducted. Okay, so I think that's it. Sorry, this was a long PowerPoint. The next PowerPoint for lab will be the, the Chapter 6 Units at Cast of Characters Lab, where we're going to look at a, a representatives of all the different groups of microbes we'll be exploring this um, semester.